Hey, it's George Chuang. Let's continue with our study in Acts, starting in chapter 13. Now in the church that was at Antioch, there were certain prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Menaean, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. The church at Antioch appears to have been very diverse. These were the prophets and teachers there, basically the leaders. Barnabas was a Levite. Simeon was called Niger, and Niger means black or he's dark-skinned. Lucius means light or white. He's fair-skinned. Menaean is a Roman. So they had a very diverse church, which is a very good sign. People of all ethnicities felt welcome. In the U.S., there are so many churches, but the problem is finding a good church. Most pastors teach topically, meaning whatever they feel like. And many times what they teach is cultural. It's not even biblical truths. For example, I heard a famous pastor say, if you're 30, move out of the house already. Stop living with your mom and dad. It was lighthearted and it was poking fun at some young people still living with their parents. But that really is preaching Americanism. Jacob left his parents' home when he was in his 70s. And in some places in Asia, if you're not married, there's nothing wrong with staying with your parents. In fact, your parents may even say you're stupid for paying rent when you can stay at home and help around the house. If your parents want you to move out, then move out. Or if you can't stand living with them, then move out. What is biblical is honor your parents. But we are never told how to do that because honoring your parents is different for every culture. Preachers have to be careful to stick to biblical truths and not cultural preferences. Now, some churches teach verse by verse, and they'll take you through the entire Bible, which is what a preacher should do. We need to feed the sheep. Healthy sheep naturally reproduce. I also notice a lot of Bible teachers don't have substance. There's no weight in their teaching. Maybe they just weren't called to be teachers. I sit in one of their sermons, and I'm dying to get out be honest. You listen to a preacher sometimes, and when it's over, you're like, I have no clue what he was talking about. I just wanted to get out of there. The Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians 2, 4, and my speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power that your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. John the Baptist preached in such a way that all from Judea and those from Jerusalem went out to hear him. Now, I'm not condemning boring preachers because this message is for me too. Let each of us fulfill our calling and use the ability God has given us. And let each of us strive to be more filled with God's power. Verse 2, as they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Spirit said, now separate to me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then having fasted and prayed and laid hands on them, they sent them away. When the Holy Spirit said, separate to me Barnabas and Saul for missionary work, we should note that they were already doing it. People are going to recognize your gift and calling. And you're naturally going to be led that way. You don't have to work and toil at it to be it. Some people want to be something they're not and weren't called to be. It's going to be a tough road. An evangelist will naturally want to evangelize. I'm not an evangelist, and I will never try to be one. When I was in seventh grade, I took a speech class because I was shy and thought maybe this will help me not be shy. When the course was over, I said I will never public speak again. I hated it years later. In college, the Holy Spirit led me to teach Sunday school. When I taught those kids the Bible, I suddenly came alive, fire in my bones as I shared those Bible stories with the kiddos. And I knew the Lord was leading me this way. The calling God has for you is going to be natural to you. Don't want to be something you weren't called to be. You'll be miserable. Verse 4, so being sent out by the Holy Spirit, and notice it was the Holy Spirit 
that sent them out, they went down to Seleucia, and from there they sailed to Cyprus. And when they arrived in Salamis, they preached the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews. They also had John as their assistant. Now when they had gone through the island to Paphos, they found a certain sorcerer, a false prophet, a Jew whose name was Bar-Jesus, who was with the proconsul, Sergius Paulus, an intelligent man. This man called for Barnabas and Saul and sought to hear the word of God. But Lemus, the sorcerer, for so his name is translated, withstood them, seeking to turn the proconsul away from the faith. Then Saul, who also is called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked intently at him and said, O oh, fool of all deceit and all fraud, you son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, will you not cease perverting the straight ways of the Lord? And now indeed the hand of the Lord is upon you, and you shall be blind, not seeing the sun for a time. And immediately a dark mist fell on him, and he went around seeking someone to lead him by the hand. Then the proconsul believed when he saw what had been done, being astonished at the teaching of the Lord. Saul gets his name changed to Paul here in verse 9. The blinding of Elimus may be to save his soul. Remember what happened to Paul on the road to Damascus. A light shone around him, and when he arose, he was blind for three days. The most important thing is to preach the gospel and save souls. Christianity isn't about health, wealth, and prosperity. It could come, but that's not the purpose, as some preachers want you to think. Christians in general have suffered throughout history. I'm not talking about the Pope or those living in luxury, but the average Christian. Missionaries were martyred. Many lived in poverty. They lived in hardship. It's really only recently that prosperity is now readily available to many. So the prosperity gospel works for these preachers. But for the last 2,000 years, there was no prosperity gospel. In our modern time, many nations are rich. And in developing nations, there's plenty of opportunity. Verse 13. Now when Paul and his party set sail from Paphos, they came to Perga in Pamphylia. And John, departing from them, returned to Jerusalem. You notice something here in verse 13. It is now Paul and his party. There appears to be a change in leadership. Paul is now heading the party. It used to be Barnabas and Paul, but now it's Paul and his party. It is here in verse 13 that John Mark, Barnabas's cousin or possibly his nephew, leaves them and returns to Jerusalem. It may be that John Mark didn't like the change in leadership because Barnabas used to be in charge. We aren't told the reason why John Mark left, but it did offend Paul. We can only speculate. Paul and Barnabas will later have a heated argument about bringing John Mark on a later missionary journey. Later in Paul's life, he will say John Mark is useful to him for ministry. So Paul eventually does have a change of heart. Verse 14, But when they departed from Perga, they came to Antioch in Pisidia, and went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and sat down. And after the reading of the law and the prophets, the rulers of the synagogue sent to them, saying, Men and brethren, if you have any word of exhortation for the people, say on. Then Paul stood up, and motioning with his hand, said, Men of Israel, and you who fear God, listen. The God of this people, Israel, chose our fathers and exalted the people when they dwelt as strangers in the land of Egypt. And with an uplifted arm, he brought them out of it. Now for a time of about 40 years, he put up with their ways in the wilderness. And when he had destroyed seven nations in the land of Canaan, he distributed their land to them by allotment. After that, he gave them judges for about 450 years until Samuel the prophet. The time period of the judges is from about 1500 to 1050 BC. Verse 21, And afterward they asked for a king. So God gave them Saul the son of Kish, a man of the tribe of Benjamin, for forty years. And when he had removed him, he raised up for them David as king. 
to whom also he gave testimony and said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart, who will do all my will. From this man's seed, according to the promise, God raised up for Israel a Savior, Jesus, after John had first preached before his coming the baptism of repentance to all the people of Israel. And as John was finishing his course, he said, Who do you think I am? I am not he. But behold, there comes one after me, the sandals of whose feet I am not worthy to loose. Men and brethren, sons of the family of Abraham, and those among you who fear God, to you the word of this salvation has been sent. For those who dwell in Jerusalem and their rulers, because they did not know him, nor even the voices of the prophets, which are read every Sabbath, have fulfilled them in condemning him. And though they found no cause for death in him, they asked Pilate that he should be put to death. Now when they had fulfilled all that was written concerning him, they took him down from the tree and laid him in a tomb. But God raised him from the dead. He was seen for many days by those who came up with him from Galilee to Jerusalem, who are his witnesses to the people. And we declare to you glad tidings, that promise which was made to the fathers. God has fulfilled this for us, their children, in that he has raised up Jesus, as it is also written in the second psalm. You are my son, today I have begotten you, and that he raised him from the dead, no more to return to corruption. He has spoken thus, I will give you the sure mercies of David. Therefore, he also says in another psalm, You will not allow your Holy One to see corruption. For David, after he had served his own generation by the will of God, fell asleep, was buried with his fathers, and saw corruption. But he whom God raised up saw no corruption. Therefore, let it be known to you, brethren, that through this man is preached to you the forgiveness of sins, and by him everyone who believes is justified from all things from which you could not be justified by the law of Moses. Preaching Jesus rising from the dead is essential for the gospel message. If Jesus did not rise from the dead, then there is no gospel. He's still in the grave, and we are still in sins. Jesus rising from the grave and through Jesus there is forgiveness of sins is the gospel message. Believing in Jesus is not about living your best life now. It's about repentance so you can have eternal life later. This life may not be so good for you. God can turn it around, but that's not the promise. The promise is life with Jesus in eternal glory. You may be killed in this life. Many Christians were murdered throughout history. Many died martyrs just trying to keep the faith. Others died sharing their faith with other people groups. It was only in the last century that the prosperity gospel started and eventually caught on. It never existed before because it was an obvious lie. But in our modern time, things have gotten so good and opportunities so abundant that this new gospel of prosperity works. People want to get rich, and the opportunity to get rich is there. So people worship God and become a Christian in hopes God will make them rich. They are basically worshiping mammon, or money, and giving him the name Jesus. When you compare people's living standard and income to what it was like a hundred years ago, and further back. It was never this good. Take the early days of the U.S. before it became a nation. People were fleeing oppression and trying to make a new life. That's why they went to America. And life was still hard for many folks, even up to the early 1900s. Then you go to Asia after World War II. Most countries were dirt poor. Singapore, South Korea, they were all poor. Singapore and South Korea are now considered rich countries. And the prosperity gospel works there because people are getting rich and they want money just like in the U.S. You drive down any city in the U.S. and everyone lives in a decent house. 
Sure, there are still poor people, but you want to see what it was like for poor people a hundred years ago? Far, far worse. The prosperity gospel does not teach repentance from sin and live a holy life that is pleasing to God. It teaches, accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, and you'll be blessed by God. You never hear them preach about sin or repentance, which is part of the gospel. Being blessed by God with wealth is not part of the gospel. We do pray that we can prosper in all things good, including health and wealth, that we may help others. But that is not a promise of God. The prosperity gospel is a perverted gospel, and I'm certain many who hold to it aren't even saved. Verse 40. Beware, therefore, lest what has been spoken in the prophets come upon you. Behold, you despisers, marvel and perish, for I work a work in your days, a work which you will by no means believe, though one were to declare it to you. So when the Jews went out of the synagogue, the Gentiles begged that these words might be preached to them the next Sabbath. Now, when the congregation had broken up, many of the Jews and devout proselytes followed Paul and Barnabas, who, speaking to them, persuaded them to continue in the grace of God. Before chapter 13, it was always Barnabas and Paul. But now it reads Paul and Barnabas because of an apparent change in leadership. The Gentiles begged to hear these words and this message the next Sabbath. This is good stuff. This is scripture being fulfilled before their eyes. They probably remember Jesus, the miracle worker, and how he died. And it's all coming together now. Verse 44, On the next Sabbath, almost the whole city came together to hear the word of God. But when the Jews saw the multitudes, they were filled with envy and contradicting and blaspheming. They opposed the things spoken by Paul. Dangerous thing about envy is even if the message is true, you will hate the person who is giving the message and seek to contradict the message. Verse 46, Then Paul and Barnabas grew bold and said, It was necessary that the word of God should be spoken to you first. But since you reject it, and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, behold, we turn to the Gentiles. To the most part, the gospel has gone to the Gentiles. The Jews don't accept Jesus as their Messiah. Some people feel we should always seek to evangelize the Jews first, and Gentiles second. But I think that's misinterpreting the scriptures. They took the gospel to the Jews first. Then it was given to the Gentiles. And that's what Paul did. He turned to the Gentiles because the Jews rejected it. Some churches feel people should be seeking to evangelize the Jews first. No, it was already preached to them and they rejected it. Sharing the gospel to whoever will receive it now is priority. Just take it to the world. Verse 47, For so the Lord has commanded us, I have set you as a light to the Gentiles, that you should be for salvation to the ends of the earth. This passage is from Isaiah 49. Some say Isaiah 49 is about Jesus, but nowhere is Isaiah 49 attributed to Jesus in the New Testament. It's my belief that the final fulfillment of Isaiah 49 will be in God's end time prophet. You can watch the Isaiah 49 study here above. Verse 48. Now when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and glorified the word of the Lord. And as many as had been appointed to eternal life believed. Those appointed to eternal life believed. Here we have human responsibility and God's divine sovereignty in who gets saved. They are two parallel roads that only God can understand. God appoints who gets eternal life. But Jesus warned the people, unless you repent, you shall perish. So there is human responsibility in that decision. Now, no one can say, I want to repent, but I can't because God didn't choose me. No, you just do it. If you are in hell, it's because you chose not to repent, not because you had no choice. If you are in hell, it's 100% your fault. If you find yourself in heaven, God says, hey, I chose you to be here. I appointed you to eternal life. Maybe it has something to do with the fact 
that God knows the beginning to the end. So he chooses those he knows will repent long before they even exist, and he helps them along. Only God knows the true answer to this mystery. Verse 49, And the word of the Lord was being spread throughout all the region. But the Jews stirred up the devout and prominent women and the chief men of the city, raised up persecution against Paul and Barnabas, and expelled them from their region. But they shook off the dust from their feet against them and came to Iconium. And the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. True Christianity in its purest form should be liked by all world governments. Why? Because Christians are to seek to live in peace and obey the authorities that exist. Even in the time of the Roman Empire, when it was ruled by emperors, Christians were to be model citizens. The only time Christians are told to resist the authorities are when the laws prohibit Christians from sharing their faith, worshiping God, or are commanded to worship another God. Those are the only times Christians become a problem for world governments. But to be law-abiding in general, Christians should be welcome. Now, I'm talking about Christianity in its purest form. Oftentimes, Christianity is mixed with the culture of the land, and then it gets exported, which is why the Philippines is mostly Catholic. They got the Catholic version of Christianity. Preachers can add things God never said into their messages. Try to catch them the next time you attend church and see how sharp you are in differentiating between the Word of God and the teachings of man. Sometimes it's not so easy. You might be surprised, but I don't support democracy. I support righteousness, which is biblical. I will add, democracy to the most part has been good since the West first transitioned to it. But that may not always be the case. When Jesus returns, it'll be a theocracy, a world ruled by God, and he'll rule with a rod of iron. Another reason Christianity is not welcome in many places is because it's not the tradition of the people. Most people will end up in hell because of tradition. They don't care about truth. They care about continuing tradition. Japan is probably the worst. If Japanese people are honest with you, most would probably choose tradition over truth. Even if they knew the truth and knew their religious traditions were a lie, they would still choose tradition. Nobody wants to be the black sheep in Japanese society. They are raised that way. But here are the facts. When you are in hell, your traditions won't matter anymore and nobody will care. You and your people inherited a lie. A heavenly-minded individual will ask the question, what is the truth about life after death? And he will seek it out. But the fact is, most don't care. They love money, they love tradition, and most pursue selfish ambitions. Beloved, let us pursue God, righteousness, and love. May God prosper you in all things good that you may be a blessing to others. The Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face to shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. God bless you guys. Bye-bye.